and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping this week on Friday, October 4th at 10 a.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. Today we are joined by a teleconference by Alice Miranda Olstein of Politico. Hello. Sandia Rahman of CQ Roll Call. Hello, everyone. And Anna Edney of Bloomberg News. Hi there. Later in this episode, we'll have my Bill of the Month interview with my KFF Health News colleague, Lauren Saucer. This month's patient is a high school athlete whose problem got fixed, but his bill did not. But first, the news. We're going to start this week with the campaign. It is October. I don't know how that happened. On Tuesday, vice presidential candidates Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio and Governor Tim Walz of Minnesota held their first and only debate. It felt very Midwestern nice with Walz playing his usual aw shuck self and Vance trying very hard to seem, for want of a better word, likable. Did we learn anything new from either candidate? I don't think I heard anything new, no. <laughs> Not that I can remember. I know, obviously, they exchanged some views on abortion. Vance tried very hard to distance himself from his own hardline views on the subject, including denying that he'd ever supported a national abortion ban, which he did, by the way. Meanwhile, during the debate, former President Trump announced on social media that he would veto a national abortion ban, something he'd not said in those exact words before. Alice, you've got a pretty provocative story out this week suggesting that this all might actually be working on a skeptical public, is it? Yes, this has been a theme I've been tracking for a little bit. It was part of the reporting I was doing in Michigan a couple weeks ago. One, what I thought was interesting about that night was Trump and Vance have been talking past each other on abortion and contradicting each other. And now oh, it yeah. finally seems that they are on the same page and in terms of trying to convince the public, nothing to see here, we won't do a national ban, don't worry about it. Democrats and abortion rights groups are running around screaming, they're lying, look at their record, look at what their allies have proposed and things like Project 2025. But the Republican message on this front does seem to be working. Um, you know, polls show that even people who care about abortion rights and support abortion rights in some of these key battleground states still plan to vote for Trump. It's a continuation of a pattern we've seen over the past few years where a decent chunk of people vote for these state ballot initiatives to protect abortion, but then also vote for anti-abortion politicians. Voters contain multitudes. We we don't know exactly if it's because they are, you know, not worried that Trump and Vance will pursue national restrictions. We don't know if it's because just other issues are more important to them. But I think it's it's really worth keeping an eye on in terms of of a pattern. And KFF has done some really interesting polling showing that people in states where the ballot initiatives have already passed sort of view it as, oh, we took care of that. It's settled. Uh, and they don't see the urgency and the threat of a national ban in the way that Democrats and abortion rights groups want them to. Which we'll talk about separately in a minute. In late breaking news, Melania Trump this week came out and said that she supports abortion rights. Is this part of the sort of continuing muddle where, you know, everybody can see what it is that they want to see? Or is this going to have any impact at all? Can I say one more thing about the debate first? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so what really struck me about what Vance said about abortion at the debate is he really portrayed two arguments that I've seen sort of trickle up from the grassroots of the anti-abortion movement. So one, there were some semantics quibbles <laughs> around what is a ban. Um, there's really been an effort in the anti-abortion movement to say that only a total ban throughout pregnancy with no exceptions, only that they call a ban. Everything else, they don't consider it a ban. It's a national standard. Yeah, minimum standard, federal standard. There's a lot of different words they use. Limit, or, you know, a restriction. But what they're describing is what others call a ban. It's not a different policy. And so we saw that on, on full display on the debate stage. 
we also saw this argument sort of that these government programs and funding and support are the answer to abortion. So, you know, basically promoting the idea that with enough child care supports and health care supports, you know, fewer people would have abortions, which the data is mixed on that, I will say, um, from the U.S. and from other countries. But financial hardship is just one of many reasons people have abortions. So, you know, that would impact some people and not others. It also goes against a lot of the sort of traditional small government, you know, cut government spending Republican ethos. And so it is this really interesting sort of like pro-natalist direction that some of the party wants to go in and some of the activist movement wants to go in. But there's definitely some tension around that. And of course, we've seen Republicans vote against those programs and funding at the state and federal level. <laughs> Things like paid family leave has been a Democratic priority long, much, much longer than it's been a Republican priority, if it ever was. Um, but it's and, interesting and it that he now. was sort of promoting that to sort of show a kinder, gentler face to the anti-abortion movement, which has been a trend we've been seeing. Yes, I think that, yes, not just from J.D. Vance, but from lots of Republicans on, on the anti-abortion side. Um, and, and Melania? <laughs> is Sorry, there, is there any impact from this? <laughs> well, it's certainly worked for Trump campaign to like muddy the waters on any subject. If you think about like immigration. And so certainly that worked before. And I think you can see where they're realizing that. And like they are coming together in like Alice mentioned with, you know, J.D. Vance and Trump talking on the same page now a bit better, but using a sort of a I don't want to say underling, but like a a, a second, a surrogate, a second, yeah, a surrogate, a secondary character to say like I I support abortion rights and like she has Trump's ear and you know that could really be a salve, salve to a lot of people. I was fascinated because she's been pretty much invisible all year. I think this is the first time we have actually heard her voice. It's the first time I have heard her voice in 2024. I would add that you know it's not unprecedented for first lady on the Republican side to come out in favor of abortion rights. I think what makes it so interesting is a how close we are to the election and that we're actively in a campaign. When we look at, you know, the remarks that like Laura Bush made several years ago, it was after Bush had left office for a few years. And so this, I think, is just what really makes it, you know, if the book is going to come out about a month or so before the election that Melania's, yeah, book. Melania's yeah. book. Yes. So yes, well, we will see. All right. Well, abortion was not the only health issue that came up during the debate. So did the Affordable Care Act. J.D. Vance went as far to claim that Donald Trump is actually the one that saved the Affordable Care Act. That's not exactly how I remember things happening. Sandy, you're shaking your this head. Is, it, it, I think this was one of the most striking parts of the debate for me, just because he made, you know, several comments about how this was a bipartisan process and Trump was trying to salvage the ACA. And, you know, for those of us that were reporting in 2017, we he was kind of like ringleading the effort to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. And I guess there were just numerous claims within like the few statements he made that were just all incorrect. You know, he was, you know, talking about how Trump had like divided risk pools and that was not something that happened. I, I think that we assumed that he was like referring to like the reinsurance waivers, but those were also created under the Obama administration. So it wasn't like a Trump invention. We just had some approved under Trump. And he'd mentioned that, you know, that enrollment was like reaching like record heights and, you know, health enrollment grew more under the Biden administration than it did under Trump. And you know, he. Yeah, I went. I went back and actually looked up those numbers because I was so I was like, "What are you talking about?" Actually, it was the moderator question. Didn't it? Didn't enrollment go up during the Trump administration? It's like, no, it went down every year. The number of uninsured went up, in fact, during the Trump administration. That's right. But I mean, this is again part of a long pattern. Trump has routinely taken credit for things that were the decisions of other administrations, both before and after him. And things that he tried to do and failed to do. Right. Like lowering drug prices. Right, 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 right. Exactly, exactly. Like Anna said, there was very little new um, that was revealed in, in this exchange. Well, elsewhere on the campaign trail, the Harris campaign is working hard to elevate health care as an issue, including rolling out not just a 60-second ad warning of what repealing the Affordable Care Act could mean, but also issuing a 43-page white paper 
theorizing what Trump and Vance are likely to have in mind with their, quote, concepts of a health care plan based on what they've said and done in the past. Um, they must be seeing something in the polls suggesting this could have some legs, don't you think? I'm I'm a little surprised because everybody keeps saying not a health care election. This is not a health care election. But I don't know. The Harris campaign sure keeps behaving like it might be. Hammering in on the pre-existing conditions and protecting those just because that is such a popular part of the ACA across the board is probably a good strategy for them just because that is something that is not the most wonky with that and that people can understand in a campaign ad and kind of like distill down. Yeah, I think that that was that was what I was thinking as well is like it's a it's it's a popular issue for Democrats, certainly to be talking about. But also like, you know, just the idea that he's talking about it in a way that people think like, oh, we don't have to worry. And Alice has made this point on abortion before, like there's a lot that he can do through, you know, executive order and things like that and did do like taking away money for the navigators and things to help people enroll. So even if they don't think it's maybe going to be about healthcare fully, it makes sense to try to to counter some of that. Um, And you can't do that on a debate stage most of the time, not in an effective way, but certainly like putting out this paper. I mean, it did get some press and things like that. And if you really wanted to go read it, you could. Even I didn't want to read all 43 pages. <laughs> yeah. so, well, as Anna previewed, uh, the AARP released what's normally a pretty routine interview with both candidates about issues important to Americans over age 50, things like Medicare, Social Security and caregiving. But I think it's fair to say that at least former President Trump's answers were anything but routine, asked how he would protect Medicare from cuts and improve the program. He said, and I quote, what we have to do is make our country successful again. This has to do with Medicare and Social Security and other things. We have to let our country become successful, make our country successful again, and we'll be able to do that. How do you even respond to things like that? Or is this campaign now so completely divorced from the issues that literally nothing matters? (laughs) Well, I kind of noticed a trend in between that answer and one J.D. Vance gave when he was talking about abortion. um, And he said... We just need to make women trust us like they need to trust us again. We need to make them trust us. And it's like, I don't understand how that even connects. But also, like, how are you going to do that? And I think that this is the same thing. You're like, you're just saying these words over and over again in relation. So in somebody's mind, Medicare and success is like Trump's word and and trust and abortion as J.D. Vance's thing. And you're connecting these in their minds. And I was seeing this as as a trend. It just felt familiar to me after listening to the vice presidential debate. They're not, you know, going to talk about any policy or anything, but repeating these words over and over again, like you were listening to a, a morning affirmations or something was going to like really get that through in a voter's mind is maybe what they're going for. And I have to say, I mean, when candidates start to talk about actual policy ideas, it gets really wonky, really fast. Sort of going back to the debate, J.D. Vance was talking about visas and immigration. And I think it's an app that he was talking about. It's like, I know this stuff pretty well. I had no idea what he was talking about. I mean, maybe it does work better if they just say, you know, when Trump says, I'm not going to cut Medicare or Social Security. Um, Well, right. Because when you when you talk specific policies, that opens it up to critique. And when you just talk total platitudes, then it's harder to pick apart and criticize, even though it's clearly not an answer to the questions they're asking. And it was even a little bit funny to me for the AARP interview, because I believe that was like they sent in written responses. And so they had the ability. I think they also (laughs) talked on the phone. So I think it was a little bit of both. Right, right, right. It wasn't the sort of like live televised interview. You know, they could have looked up. (laughs) It was an open book test. (laughs) Um, It was. (laughs) And and yet all of the responses from Trump were just like, we're going to do something and it's going to be great and awesome and it'll fix everything. And it was completely devoid of policy specifics, which, again, may be... (laughs) smarter politically than actually saying what you plan to do, which, uh, you know, as we've seen in Project 2025, generates a lot of backlash. Um, But it is also a little bit dangerous to go into the election not knowing the specifics of what someone wants to do on healthcare. Yeah, I know. I find it, you know, when I listen to some of these focus groups with undecided voters, like, we want to know what exactly they're going to do, except they don't really want to know what exactly they're going to do. They think they do, but 
it appears that that is not necessarily the case. One thing that we know does matter, at least to people on Medicare, is the premiums they pay for their coverage. And unfortunately for every administration, that announcement comes just weeks before Election Day every year. So this year, the Biden administration was worried about big jumps in premiums for Medicare Part D drug coverage, mostly thanks to the new caps on spending that will save consumers money but will cost insurers more. Uh, That didn't happen, though. And in fact, average premiums will actually fall slightly next year. Now, I'm not sure I understand exactly what the administration did to avoid this, but they used existing demonstration authority to boost payments to insurers. And not surprisingly, Republicans are pretty furious. On the other hand, Republicans use pretty much this same authority to avoid Medicare premium spikes in the past. Anna, is this just political manipulation or good governing or a little (laughs) bit of both? Yeah, it is certainly very timely um, and what's probably necessary also because the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, kept the seniors out of pocket pay at 2000 a year. And so that was going to skyrocket premiums um, and they did not want to face that, particularly in an election year. And as you mentioned, this all happens around that time. And so they did this demonstration and I have read like a few things trying to figure out exactly what it does. And I oh, it's can't. not just me. It's, it's complicated. not just you. It's really complicated. And it has to do with payments that usually come at the end that insurers are now going to get up front. And that's like the best I can I, I can, you know, tell you, but they'll be getting some subsidies up front. And it's to try to spread this premium increases, you know, to to help mitigate those so that seniors don't have to then pay on that end um, instead of for their drugs out of pocket. So I think that they need to do something. I mean, already the premiums were able to go up. I think it's like $35 a month and and some plans did elect to do that and others have them staying even and you even have some with them going down a little bit. So I guess the moral of the story is for consumers is shop around this year, certainly. That's right. And we will talk more about Medicare open enrollment, which opens in a couple of weeks because it's October and all of these things happen at once. Moving back to abortion, um, a judge in Georgia struck down, at least for now, the state's six-week abortion ban, uh, quoting from The Handmaid's Tale about how the law requires women to serve as human incubators. And I'll put a link to the decision because it's quite the decision. But Alice, this is far from the last word on this, right? Yes. It's just so fascinating what a slow burn these lawsuits are. I mean, you know, this, the one in North Dakota recently that restored access, these just sort of simmer under the radar for months or even years. And then a decision can have a a major impact. And so these access has been restored in some of these states. Some interesting things that came to mind were, one, it could you know, be reversed again and ping pong back and forth. And all of that is very challenging for doctors and patients to manage. But also, you know, and I'm thinking more of North Dakota because, you know, Georgia is sort of a a medical powerhouse with like a lot of providers and hospitals and facilities and stuff. But in, in North Dakota, you know, the state's only abortion clinic moved out of state and they do not plan to move back as a result of, of this decision. You know, this isn't a switch you can flip back and forth. And so when access is restored on paper in the law, That doesn't mean it's going to be restored in practice. You need doctors willing to work in these states and provide the procedure. And, you know, even with the court rulings, they may not feel comfortable doing so or the logistics are just too daunting to to move back. So would urge people to keep that in mind. Yeah. And the state's already said that it's going to appeal to the next higher court. So we will see this continue. But I think it was definitely worth mentioning. You know, we talked a lot this year about women experiencing pregnancy complications, not being able to get care in states with abortion bans and restrictions. Well, it's happening in states where abortion is supposed to be widely available, too. In California, the state's attorney general filed suit this week against a Catholic hospital in the rural northern part of the state that refused to terminate the doomed pregnancy of a woman carrying twins after her water broke at 15 weeks because, they said, one of the twins still had a heartbeat. She eventually was driven to the only other hospital within 100 miles of the labor and delivery unit where she did get the care that she needed, although she was hemorrhaging. But not until after a nurse at the Catholic hospital gave her a bucket of towels, quote, in case something happens in the car. Meanwhile, the labor and delivery unit at the hospital she was taken to is itself scheduled to close. Are women starting to get the idea that this is about more than just selective abortions and that no matter where they live, that being pregnant could be 
more dangerous than it has been in the past? I was going to say this is something that, you know, abortion rights advocates have been saying for years now that it's not just abortion, that, you know, they point to things like, you know, the whole ordeal that we've been having with with IVF and, and birth control and so many other things. And even in the last couple of years, people trying to get other medications that have nothing to do with pregnancy and not being able to get those because they might have an effect or, or cause miscarriage or things like that. So I think in one way, yes. But at the same time, when you look at something like what we saw happen with the two deaths in Georgia, right? The messaging from the anti-abortion crowd has been that this was not because of the abortion ban, but because of the regulations that allowed these people to get medication abortion. And that's what's driving the death. So we think that in some ways there's certain camps that are just going to be focused on, you know, a different side of how the emergency might not be related to abortion at all or like the branding is that this is not an abortion in certain cases versus an abortion just like semantics. So I don't know how many like minds it's changing at this point. Like Sandy has said, the awareness that this is not just for so-called elective abortions. Obviously, you know, that term is disputed and there's gray area of what that means. I think the overwhelming focus in messaging from, you know, Democrats anyway, has been about these wanted pregnancies that suffer medical complications and people can't get care. And so the spillover effect on um, miscarriage care. But I think the piece that's new that this could emphasize is that it's not a strict red state, blue state divide that Catholic hospitals and, you know, other facilities in states with protections like California, it could happen there too. So I think that's what this case may be contributing in a new way to people's understanding. And of course, this was happening long before Dobbs. I mean, with Catholic hospitals, particularly Catholic hospitals in areas where there are not a lot of hospitals denying care according to Catholic teachings and women having basically no place at least nearby to go. So it just, I think people are seeing it sort of in, in a new light now that it's sort of a, it, it seems to be happening in, in many, many places at the same time. Well, while we are visiting California, Governor Gavin Newsom this week signed legislation uh, requiring large group health insurance plans to cover IVF and other fertility treatments starting next year. California is far from the first state to do this. I think it's now up to over a dozen, but it's by far the most populous state to do this. Um, do we expect to see more of this, particularly given sort of the, as you were saying, Sandy, the the attention that IVF is suddenly getting? You know, I think we we could. We've had a lot of states kind of do different variations of those so far, and they haven't necessarily been like blue versus red. I think one thing that was interesting about the California law in particular was that it included LGBTQ people within the infertility definition, which we've been having IBS laws for like over 20 years at this point. And I don't know that that has been necessarily there in other ones. So I would be watching for more things like that and seeing how widespread that would be in some of the bills coming up in the next legislative cycle. Yes, and another issue that I suspect will continue to simmer beyond this election. Well, finally this week, two big uh, business of health related stories. Over the summer, we talked about how the CEO of Steward Healthcare, which is a chain of hospitals bought out by private equity and basically run into bankruptcy, refused to show up to testify before the Senate Health Education, Labor and Pensions Committee. Well, in the last two weeks, the committee, followed by the full Senate, voted to hold CEO Ralph De La Torre in criminal contempt. And as of last week, he is now ex-CEO Ralph De La Torre. And now he is suing the Senate over that contempt vote. Um, if nothing else, I guess this raises the stakes in Congress to continue to look at the impact of private equity in health care. Yeah, I think it's interesting because when you look at Bernie Sanders calling in pharmaceutical CEOs and they typically show up and they, you know, they take their hits and they go home. And th in this case, it probably kind of heightens that idea that private equity is the evil person. And I'm not saying everyone thinks pharma is not, but they do understand Washington. And, and there's a chance that a lot of New York focused, Wall Street focused private equity folks may not get that 
quite in the same way or or just to be not view it as a, as important but now that may be <laughs> changing um i was surprised by how bipartisan this was i mean you know yeah. beating up on pharma tends to be a democratic thing but this was bipartisan in the committee and bipartisan in the senate and if this is not i mean it's also important to remember that stored health care is a chain of hospitals in a whole bunch of states so there are a lot of senators who are seeing hospitals in now dire straits through this whole private equity thing, who I imagine are not very happy about it. And their constituents are not very happy about it. But I think the bipartisanship of it is what sort of stuck out to me. I was just say hospitals are such a big employer for so many districts that I think that. But I would say, you know, this was like the first time in 50 years they've sent a contempt charge to the DOJ. And especially doing that in an unanimous fashion is is just very striking to me. And I'm curious, you know, what, you know, if DOJ kind of goes forth and, and does takes penalty in action with it. Yeah, this is this is a real under the radar story that I think could explode in a big way at some point. Well, the other big evolving business story this week involves Medicare Advantage, the private sector alternative that gives enrollees extra benefits and makes insurance shareholders rich, mostly at taxpayer expense. Well, the party is, if not ending, then at least slowly closing down. Humana's stock price dropped dramatically this week after the company reported that the new way Medicare officials are calculating quality scores for Medicare Advantage, they get stars, um, you know, sort of the more stars, the better. The new way that Humana appears to be getting its stars could effectively deprive it of its entire operating profit. In separate news, United Healthcare is suing Medicare over its Medicare Advantage payments in one of those single judge conservative districts in Texas, of course. Democrats have been working to at least somewhat rein in these sort of excess payments to Medicare Advantage for the past, I don't know, two decades or so. Um, but I assume this will all likely be reversed if Trump wins. I mean, and a Medicare Advantage has been a troublesome issue because it's really popular with beneficiaries, but it's really expensive because it's really popular because they get extra money and some of that extra money goes to give extra benefits. Talk about things that are hard to explain to people. It's like it's it's great that you get all these extra benefits, but, you know, it's costing the government more than it should. I guess I do yes. wonder if people, you know, how much attention they're paying, you know, are they going to switch plans if it's dropping that many stars? You know, if you're in a Humana plan and, you know, a huge number of them got demoted to a lower rating, you know, the next time you're looking for a plan, are you going to switch to something else? And how often people are doing that? And just if that would move the needle, because it's just a, it's a longer process than than. Overnight. Although I think it's not just it isn't just that people have to switch. If people stay in those plants with fewer stars, the company gets less money because yeah. they get bonuses when people are in the, the quote unquote higher quality plan. So even if they even if their you know four star plan is now a three star plan and they stay in it, the company's going to lose money, which I think is why the stock price took such a quick and dramatic bath. Yeah, I was surprised. It's such a seemingly wonky issue, but you know it did really hit Humana very hard in, in the stock price. Technically, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the stars aren't even out yet. This is like people doing searches to see if they can find some of them that have been changed at all. And so they're, they're coming out soon. But Humana particularly is very Medicare focused out of all of the insurers. They rely on that for a large part of their revenue. So it is a big deal for them. Um, I don't know how much, but certainly Wall Street was. And as you mentioned with Trump, the Republicans typically really have supported Medicare Advantage because it is private insurers offering this instead of being just government run Medicare. So that could have an effect. Um, it's it's hard to tell why their stars went down currently. And the with United Health, you at least get a little insight. They're suing because last year their star rating went down for some plans because of one they said they said because of one bad customer service phone call. So someone from, you know, Medicare calls and does a test thing and United Health says they didn't ask the right question. So the person never got a chance to answer it correctly. And then their star ratings went down. So, I mean, it, it does feel like it could happen at, at any point for any reason. I, so I don't know how conducive that, uh, like how much that actually plays into people who might have a Humana plan that think, oh, it, I haven't had any issues, so why would I change? Yeah, for all, I mean, it, it's worth, you know, all these under the hood things that, as, as you point out, we have all looked at and don't quite understand is 
worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. It's one of the reasons why healthcare is so expensive and such a big part of the economy. All right, well, we will continue to watch that space too. That is the news for the week. Now we will play my Bill of the Month interview with Lauren Saucer, and then we will come back with our extra credits. I am pleased to welcome to the podcast my KFF Health News colleague, Lauren Saucer, who reported and wrote the latest KFF Health News Bill of the Month. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So tell us about this month's patient, who he is, and what kind of medical care he needed. This month's patient is a young man named Preston Knobs. He's 17. He's a senior in high school. He lives in Hoover, Alabama, which is right outside of Birmingham. And he played youth sports his whole life and recently is focused on lacrosse. But like many kids in this country, has sort of cycled through a bunch of different sports and ended up injured last year. And what happened? She had really debilitating pain in his hip, and the pain was progressive, and obviously they tried some treatments on one end of the spectrum, but it kept growing worse and worse. And at one point last year, he ended up limping off of the lacrosse field. He couldn't do really simple things like turning over in bed or getting in and out of a car. These things were really painful for him. So he ended up as a patient at a sports medicine clinic, and providers at that clinic recommended surgery. And to cut to the chase, the story, at least medically, has a happy ending, right? The surgery worked. He's yes, better. the surgery worked. He got he ended up getting something late last year, a procedure called a sports hernia repair, which is a little bit of a misnomer because he didn't actually have a hernia. But it's kind of a catch-all phrase that orthopedic surgeons use to talk about a procedure to relieve this type of pain that he was having sort of in his pelvis groin area. And the recovery was longer than he was anticipating. But yes, it medically does have a happy ending. He was able to play lacrosse again, although the last time I spoke to him, he had another sports-related injury in his foot. The sports hernia repair didn't do what it was supposed to do. So that's the good news. So it sounded like it should have been routine. Kid growing up gets hurt playing sports, family has health insurance, goes to sports medicine, doctor fixes problem. Except for the bill, right? (laughs) Yes. So the interesting thing about this story, and, and this is really why we pursued it, is because there is no CPT code for a sports hernia repair. CPT codes, your listeners are probably familiar with, but they're the medical codes that providers and insurers use to figure out how things get paid for. And it can become more complicated when there's no code for a procedure, which was the case here. So Preston's dad was told before the surgery that he was going to have to pay up front because his insurance company, which was Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, likely wasn't going to pay for it. And how much was it up front? It was just over 7000 So the surgery itself was 6000 There was, I think, almost 500 for anesthesia, a little over 600 for the facility fee. And Preston's dad paid for it on a few different credit cards. So it, kid has the surgery, is in rehab, and dad is now trying to recoup this money that he has paid for up front. And what happened then? Yeah, before the surgery even happened, Preston's dad tried to call his insurance company and say, can I get this covered? My son's doctor says this is medically necessary. And initially he got n- good news. His insurer said, you know, it sounds like this is something that should be covered. If this is something that's medically necessary, your insurance plan generally covers those things. As the date of the surgery grew closer and closer, he found that the people he was talking to, the insurance company, weren't being as definitive with their answers. And so before the surgery, he got a no. He said he got a no from his insurer saying that they were not going to cover this. Now, on the back end of the surgery, after he'd paid the bill with those credit cards, he tried to appeal that decision by filing a lot of paperwork. And he did end up getting a few hundred dollars reimbursed. But when the insurer sent him that check, it was unclear exactly what they were covering. And obviously, that didn't come close to the 7000 plus that they had paid for it. 
So that's what eventually happened with the bill, right? He ended up getting stuck with almost all of it. Yeah. Is there anything he could have done differently that might have helped this uh, get reimbursed? That's the tricky thing about this story because they did do almost everything right, but it's almost a cautionary tale for people who are faced with this prospect in the future. So if your provider is recommending something that doesn't have a CPT code, it is going to be harder to get reimbursed from your insurer. You should assume that. That's not to say it's impossible, but it's going to take more work on your end. It's going to take more paperwork. It may take more work on your doctor's end. And you should be prepared to get some pushback, if that makes sense. And has he just sort of written this off? He's, I mean, he paid off the surgery using the credit cards. And the last I spoke to this family, they were still getting some confusing communication from their insurer. I don't know that they've gotten the final, final no yet. I think that he still is invested in getting reimbursed if he can. But at this point, we're approaching almost the one-year anniversary of the surgery. So it's it's looking less likely. Well, we will keep following it. Lauren Saucer, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay, we're back. Now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week we think you should read too. Don't worry if you missed the details. We'll include links to all these stories in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Uh, We have two hurricane-related extra credits this week. Uh, Sandy, why don't you go first? My extra credit this week is called Without Water After Helene, Residents at Asheville Public Housing Complex Fear for Their Health. And it is from the Asheville Citizen Times by Jacob Biba. And the story just looks at the residents of a specific complex in Asheville that have been hit really hard by the hurricane. And when this was written, they hadn't they'd been without water for two days and it might not come back for weeks. And just some of the public health impacts they were facing, you know, one person couldn't clean their nebulizer or their tracheostomy tube. You know, others were worrying about sanitation from not being able to flush toilets. And I think it's a a good one to, to check out. Yeah, you know, we think about so many things with hurricanes, but we think about being without power. We don't tend to think about being without water. Alice, you have a related story. Yeah, and then this is more of a supply chain story, but um, really shows that these hurricanes and natural disasters can have really widespread impacts outside the region that they're in. And so this is from the Wall Street Journal. It's called Hospitals Hit with IV Fluid Shortage After Hurricane Helene. It's by Joseph Walker and Peter Loftus. And it's about a facility in North Carolina that produces, like I said, IV bag fluids um, that hospitals around the country depend on. And yeah, I mean, we've talked before about just how vulnerable our medical supply chains are. And we don't spread the risk around maybe as much as, as we need to in this, this uh, age of uh, climate instability. And so, yeah, hospitals, they're not rationing the fluids, but they are taking steps to conserve. Um, and so they're they're thinking like, OK, can certain patients can take fluids orally instead of intravenously in order to conserve? And so that's happening now. Hopefully it doesn't become rationing down the road. But yeah, with the long recovery the region is expecting, it's a bit scary. Anna. Um, I did one from a colleague of mine at Bloomberg, John Tazi, and it's a free drug experiment bypasses the U.S. health system's secret fees. So he looked at this Blue Shield of California plan that is deciding to just bypass the pharmacy benefit managers and go directly to a drug maker um, to get a, a biosimilar of Humira, the rheumatoid arthritis and many other ailments drug. And they're going to be getting it for 525 a month for this drug that a lot of the PBMs are offering for more than a thousand dollars. And so the PBMs mentioned to him, you know, we give rebates and it's less than a thousand dollars. But They didn't say if it was as low as as 525 and Blue Shield of California seems to think that this is a really good deal and that they're basically going to give it for free just to show that it can reach Americans affordably. And so I thought it was a good look at this plan and at maybe a trend. I don't know. The plans might start going outside of the PBM network. We shall see. Well, I chose a story from KFF Health News this week from Ronnie Cohen, and it's called Doctors urging conference boycotts over abortion bans face uphill battle. And it's a really thoughtful piece about how to best protest things you disagree with. 
in this case, some doctors want medical groups to move professional conferences out of states with abortion bans in order to exert financial pressure and to make a point. But there are those who worry that that amounts to punishing the victims and that it won't do much anyway, frankly, unless you're the Super Bowl or the baseball all-star game. It's not like your conference is going to make or break some city's annual budget. But it's a microcosm of a bigger debate that's going on in medicine that I've been covering. How do doctors balance their duty to serve patients with their duty to themselves and their own families? There are obviously pregnant medical professionals who do not wish to travel to states with abortion bans lest something bad happens. It's a struggle that is obviously going to continue and it's a really interesting story. Okay, that is our show. Before we go this week, it is October, and we want your scariest Halloween haikus. The winner will get their haiku illustrated by our award-winning in-house artist, and I will read it on the podcast that we tape on Halloween. We will have a link to the entry page in our show notes. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us, too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our editor, Emory Hudeman. Also, as always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at whatthehealth, all one word, at kff.org. Or you can still find me at X. I'm at Jay Robner. Sandia? At Sandia Wright. Anna? At Anna Edney. Alice? At Alice Olstein. We will be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy.